Welcome to the first virtual hearing of the Penn Public Safety Review and Outreach Initiative. I'm Dorothy Roberts, a Penn Integrates Knowledge Professor of Africana Studies, Law, and Sociology. And I, along with Reverend Chas Howard, are leading this initiative as appointed advisors to Penn President Amy Gutman. Reverend Howard will introduce himself and welcome you in a minute. We're working with the law school's Quattrone Center for the Fair Administration of Justice, and you'll hear from its executive director, John Holloway, after Reverend Howard. The Public Safety Review and Outreach Initiative is conducting a comprehensive review of public safety at Penn. The goal of the review is to assess Penn's success in creating a physically and emotionally safe environment on campus and in the surrounding community, while treating every person with equal dignity and respect, and in a way that prioritizes and promotes anti-racism, racial equality, and justice. The outcome of the initiative will be a report and recommendations that we will present to President Amy Gutman, Executive Vice President Craig Carnaroli, and Provost Wendell Pritchett in the fall. Our report and recommendations will be based on two main efforts. First, we've begun collecting and reviewing hundreds of documents from Penn's Division of Public Safety regarding a wide range of policies, procedures, and outcomes, including use of force, vehicle and pedestrian stops, complaints, budgets, transparency, and relationships with other policing agencies. The second part is why we're here today. We're holding a series of virtual hearings to receive input from members of the Penn and West Philadelphia communities on their experiences with Penn's Department of Public Safety and on their ideas and suggestions. The hearings will be made publicly available via live stream and recorded for future public access. Reverend Howard and I both have long records of commitment to racial justice, and we approach our leadership of this initiative very seriously and independently. We have been given complete freedom to listen, to learn, and to make recommendations without any pressure from the university administration. Our aim is to move Penn toward achieving a vision of public safety that treats everyone with equal respect, in which everyone can feel physically and emotionally safe with a sense of equal belonging and that pri prioritizes racial justice. I'll now turn the floor to my co-presidential advisor, Reverend Chaz Howard. Thank you, Professor Roberts. And I, I will only add very briefly so we can get to uh, hearing from our guests today. I think I just wanna echo and say thank you to everyone who is tuned in this afternoon. And thank you to the many, many, many people on and around our university who care deeply about these issues. This is uh, deeply um, important to a whole lot of us. And it's important for us to name the fact that we take this very seriously. I, there's a lot of distrust for institutions in the world right now, um, understandably and rightly so. And I think Professor Roberts and I do want to communicate that uh, the university takes this very seriously. This is not meant to be uh, just a committee for show or anything at all like that, but that we're committed to hearing from a range of voices, uh, representing faculty, staff, student, alumni in many cases, and several voices from the surrounding community who, uh, who are, are more than neighbors, but are we consider to be a part of our family, and folks who are also wrestling with this hard issue of contemporary policing in America. We want to make sure the whole process is fair and open. And one of the important things to us as we planned for this has been transparency. And so we're, we're grateful for, uh, even in difficult times where we can't be together physically, uh, technology that allows for this process to be uh, as open as can be from all around the area. Uh, finally, I, I want to thank the Quattrone Center who uh, has done a lot of the, of the of the hard heavy lift early on in kind of pulling this together. Um, and thank you to all of our guests who 
will be sharing and have made themselves available uh, to, to some hard questions. And I turn it over to Dr. John Holloway to, to get us started. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Roberts and Reverend Howard. Um, much appreciated for those remarks. Um, my name is John Holloway. I'm the executive director of the Quattron Center for the Fair Administration of Justice at the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School. Um, we've been asked to facilitate this public safety review and outreach initiative, and it's our great honor, uh, pleasure, and privilege to participate with the two of you, with all of the people that are uh, about to speak, um, with the Department of Public Safety, who has present, provided us with a lot of uh, documentary information, and really with the Penn and West Philadelphia communities in having these really important conversations at this pivotal time. Um, my role here today is really just to explain the ground rules for what we're doing today and in the hearings to follow. Um, I think at the outset, I wanna make sure everybody is reminded and aware that we are recording this. Uh, we will post the recording and uh, separately a transcript uh, of the recording on the Public Safety Review and Outreach Initiative website, which is www.penpublicsafetyreview. That's all one word, penpublicsafetyreview.org. This is the first in a series of virtual webinar hearings that are designed to provide perspectives from throughout Penn and our larger West Philadelphia community so that uh, this process can assess Penn's success in creating both a physically and emotionally safe environment for all of our colleagues, our visitors, and our neighbors in which every person is treated with dignity and respect and in a way that prioritizes and promotes anti-racism, racial equality, and justice. We will have additional hearings throughout the next uh, month or so gathering a wide diversity of viewpoints and perspectives. Uh, the next hearing is gonna be Tuesday, August 18th at 2 p.m. We'll be providing additional information on that at the end of this session. Uh, and again, on the website at penpublicsafetyreview.org. Anyone who wishes to provide additional information, thoughts, ideas, suggestions, or perspectives on this initiative, on the Department of Public Safety, or on the University of Pennsylvania Police Department, can also do that on the website. That information can be provided in an anonymous fashion if you would choose to do so. We also are accepting voice messages at 215-746-4572. I'll say that one more time, 215-746-4572. For today, uh, we have six invited speakers. Uh, to ensure clear conversations, we're gonna ask the speakers to go one at a time while others are muted. We're gonna start with the first three speakers, Vice President Rush, Dr. Colhane, and Dr. Dubay, providing their statements in turn, and then an opportunity for that group to do a brief question and answer with uh, Professor Roberts and Reverend Howard. Um, and then we'll go to the second group of speakers uh, in the same way, Professor Austin, Ms. Pilgrim, and Dr. Best. Um, members of the audience are encouraged to submit questions at any time through the Q&A feature that's found at the ribbon at the bottom of the window. We are actively monitoring that Q&A, but given the number of speakers and the time we have, we can't promise that we'll be able to answer every question here in this session. The questions are being recorded and stored and we will do our best to answer those questions uh, to the extent possible going forward. We recognize that the topics that we're gonna be discussing are deeply felt throughout our community and may be emotional. We'd ask that members of the audience please keep your questions topical and appropriate and uh, reserve the ability to remove any member of the audience uh, who makes the Q&A uh, difficult for us to sift through for those reasons. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it back to Professor Roberts, Reverend Howard, and our first speaker, Maureen Rush, the Vice President for Public Safety at Penn and the Superintendent of the Penn Police. Thanks very much, uh, and uh, we really appreciate your assistance here, and thank you, Vice President Rush, for being willing to, to appear. Thank you, John. I want to thank the Quadrone Center, Executive Director John Holloway, Academic Director Paul Heaton, as well as the Presidential Advisors, Penn Law Professor Dorothy Roberts, and Vice President for Social Equity and Community, Reverend Ch Chaz Howard, for all of their efforts. The Penn Public Safety, um, I need to stop this. Excuse me one second. I want to first acknowledge the hurt, rage, and pain we are feeling around policing and race. I was horrified and deeply saddened at the death of Mr. George Floyd and Ms. Breonna Taylor at the hands of police. I am a police officer and I have been dedicated 44 years of my life providing safety and security to communities, 
The actions of these police officers tarnish the reputation of all law enforcement officers. George Floyd and Breonna Taylor's deaths and the deaths of numerous people of color were and are preventable. There were numerous points of failure. Best practices in policing dictate that police officers must be well-trained, receive discipline when they violate state and federal laws for when they disregard their department's policies and procedures. Furthermore, there must be checks and balances to ensure that every officer is abiding by the laws and their policies and procedures. And these practices must be held accountable. And when they are not, discipline must occur. In the, in the Division of Public Safety at Penn, we do this within a context of structural, excuse me, structural racism that exists at every level in our society. Every day when we come to work, we endeavor to provide an environment in which every community member feels physically and emotionally safe and welcome and is treated with dignity and respect at all times in ways to prioritize and promote racial equality and justice. When I entered law enforcement in 1976, I was a 22 year old closeted lesbian. I was hired by the Philadelphia Police Department as one of the first 100 women to work street patrol. Then Mayor Frank Rizzo fought the Department of Justice, but finally was forced under a court decree to hire 100 women for a two year pilot program. I learned a lot about prejudice, racism, sexism, and homophobia as a targeted and unwelcome minority police officer. I also witnessed extreme racism directed at my black colleagues, both on and off duty. I was deeply affected by watching the overt racism that my friends and colleagues endured. This informed my ideas about how to supervise and lead in a police department. My last three years there in the Philadelphia Police, I was a lieutenant and a trainer in the Philadelphia Police Advanced Training Bureau. I became deeply committed to the value of training in creating best practices, and I brought this love of training to our Penn Police Department in 1994. So allow me to give you an overview of the Penn Division of Public Safety. Policing is one aspect of our division, and we have six other departments who work 24-7, 365 days a year to promote safety in our community. These include special services, our victim advocacy program, fire and emergency preparedness, PENCOM Emergency Communication Center, information and security technology, security services department, which manages our allied universal security officer program, and the finance and administration department. Let me also share the mission statement of the Division of Public Safety. The mission of the University of Pennsylvania Division of Public Safety is to enhance the quality of life, safety, and security of our community. The division accomplishes its mission through the delivery of a comprehensive and integrated safety and security program in partnership with the community that we serve. The members of the Division of Public Safety reflect the diversity of our community. We pledge to deliver professional safety and security services that value and respect the rights and differences of all members of the division, as well as those of the University of Pennsylvania and the University City communities that we are all proudly serving. We are committed to the professional and personal development of all members of the Division of Public Safety. And in turn, we expect all of our employees to be models of excellence. Ultimately, we strive each and every day to earn the trust, confidence, and respect of our community. We live our mission statement. Diversity is hugely important to us and in partnership with the Division of Human Resources and the Office of Affirmative Action, I'm proud to report that almost 40% of Penn police officers identify as minorities and 48% of our entire division identify as minorities. 10% of public safety members live in West Philadelphia. Our goal for inclusion extends to the safety partner Allied Universal where 47% of our security officers on the Penn account live in six West Philadelphia zip codes. We make every effort to partner with our Penn and West Philadelphia communities. We have many outreach programs. These programs match Penn police supervisors, special services advocates, detectives, fire and emergency preparedness specialists with cultural center directors and college house directors here at Penn. 
We also attend monthly West Philadelphia community meetings such as First Thursday, Spruce Hill, Garden Court, Cedar Park Neighbors, and Walnut Hill Community Association. And we are on a first name basis with our community members. Our motto, which is embraced throughout our division, is it's all about relationships. This philosophy became my mantra back in 1976 as I walked footbeats and learned the value of relationships within the community I served. This philosophy enables us to partner and serve with our Penn and West Philadelphia communities. I am enormous, enormously proud of the members of the Division of Public Safety and for the relationships we have built within these communities. I look forward to responding to your questions. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate. Thank you, VP Rush, um, for your remarks and for your, uh, your leadership as well. Thank um, you. John, just process-wise, we'll be uh, engaging each speaker. Did you want to run through all the... I, th I think what we'll do now is we'll turn to Dr. Colhane, if that's okay, and we'll do Dr. Colhane and Dr. Dubay, and then we'll do questions for the group of three. Okay. Uh, so the next to speak is uh, Dr. Dennis Colhane, the Dennis, Dana and Andrew Stone Chair in Social Policy and the Chair of the Penn Division of Public Safety Advisory Board. Dr. Colhane, thank you very much. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, as you said, I'm Dennis Colhane. I'm a professor of social policy in the School of Social Policy and Practice. I've been a member of the Public Safety Advisory Board since it was established in 2000. Uh, the board is strictly advisory in function and does not have a formal charter or charge or policy making role. Participation is voluntary and by invitation from the VP for Public Safety in consultation with the board member chair, which is currently my role. Uh, at present, all members are either students, faculty, or staff of the university. Uh, they are invited based on their roles as representatives of various administrative units on campus, uh, as faculty with relevant domain expertise or as student government or student organization leaders or staff affiliated with BPUL. For example, some of the administrative units represented would include the transportation and parking office, facilities and real estate services, the general counsel's office, uh, business services, intergovernmental relations, alumni relations, risk management, etc. Uh, some faculty are involved who have expertise in criminology, domestic violence, or homelessness. Uh, student government or organization representatives include leadership from GAPSA and the Undergraduate Assembly, uh, and University Life representatives from the LGBTQ Center, International House, Student Housing, and uh, the Chaplain's Office. The advisory board meets four times a year during the academic year, twice in the fall semester and twice in the spring semester. The agenda typically involves a presentation by the VP providing an update on crime statistics, which can involve presentations by various division leaders and presentations on other current topics of attention. For example, this could include a briefing on the deployment of body cameras or about recent trainings that have been held for staff, uh, or about any recent crime incidents or trends. Uh, each meeting also includes an open forum for board members to raise issues of concern that they may have. About half of the two hour meeting is usually devoted to the open forum. The fourth and final meeting of the year, usually held in April, is the only one that comes with a specific agenda item which is to review the year's statistics on bias-based profiling, uh, customer and citizen satisfaction survey results, and complaints against police. Um, this yearly review was one of the recommendations from the ad hoc committee on bias-based profiling uh, that issued its report in 2004. Uh, because of the union contract does not permit a civilian complaint review process, uh, complaints are reviewed internally by police department leadership. The details of each incident um, without identifying information are described to the board as, it, as is the disposition from the internal investi investigation. Uh, the advisory board members have an opportunity to ask questions and to discuss the incidents and whatever sanctions or actions have been taken. 
From my vantage point, uh, the board has provided a valuable space for discussion of public safety issues and policies uh, among a fairly diverse set of stakeholders from a broad set of university constituents. Uh, it, is a, it has enabled the university community to provide input to DPS policies and procedures, to speak directly on a regular basis to leadership of the division about their concerns, and for DPS to have regular communication with the various groups represented. It has also provided a valuable personal connection among the people and groups on campus with DPS so that more immediate issues of concern can be taken up in between meetings uh, directly with key points of contact. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate today and I'm glad to respond to any questions you have. Thank you, Dr. Colhane. Uh, at this point, we would turn to Dr. Benoit Dubé, the, uh, an associate professor of clinical psychiatry, but also uh, the associate provost and Penn's chief wellness officer. Uh, Dr. Dubé. Thank you very much. Um, professor Roberts, Reverend Howard, uh, members of the committee, good afternoon. And I'd like to start by uh, expressing my gratitude for being able to share thoughts and perspectives on the Penn public safety system. In my capacity as Chief Wellness Officer for the university, I oversee the delivery of clinical services for students' physical and emotional health. I'm referring here to Student Health Service and CAPS, our Counseling and Psychological Services uh, Center or clinic. I also oversee programs pertaining to disease prevention, health education, and well-being promotion that are managed by Campus Health, our public health department for the entire student body. When it comes to the mental health of our students, Penn's Department of Public Safety and its officers have been trusted partners and allies with CAPS or Counseling Center in times of crisis. It is readily apparent and has become increasingly so over the past two years since I became Chief Wellness Officer, that DPS provides training in dealing with mental health issues to its officers. In times of crisis, officers have demonstrated the ability to patiently de-escalate situations, preventing unfortunate outcomes. I should also mention that despite the often unpleasant and stressful circumstances of such interactions, seldom have students filed complaints about officers' interventions during these times of crisis. Such examples include intoxicated behaviors, threatening behaviors, threats of self-harm or suicide attempts. In these situations, officers have predictably shown the ability to modulate their own emotional response in these times, putting the students' needs above their own. And often over time, officers developed somewhat of a therapeutic alliance with students who required repeated interventions. This goes back to and really supports what we heard from Vice President Rush. It is about relationships. Officers have also shown the ability to work with our after hours service for mental health crises. This type of therapeutic alliance is unheard of in typical police forces. To its credit, Penn Police has been able to tailor the training of its officers to the specific needs of our campus population. This is also evident in the call center staff who answer our campus helpline as they're able to not only identify the right resource for callers, but also provide reassurances to parents who may be calling with concerns about their students, for example. I'd also like to add that the opinion I expressed about the unique ability of Penn Police to provide much needed assistance in times of crisis is also formed in comparison to direct observations I have made when Philadelphia police officers were involved in addressing the suicidality of patients under my direct and personal care as a psychiatrist. As members of the university's public safety review and outreach initiative conduct their comprehensive review of public safety at Penn to assess Penn's success in creating a physically and emotionally safe environment on campus, I hope to remind the committee of the strengths that DPS brings to our ability to address students' ever-present mental health concerns. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Dubé. Uh, Professor Roberts, Reverend Howard, uh, the floor is yours. And thank you everybody for your prepared remarks and uh, your openness to hearing a few questions. We'll 
be asking our questions uh, in turn, uh, first for Vice President Rush, uh, then Professor Colhane, and then Dr. Dubé. Uh, Professor, or Vice President Rush, my first question, and again, thank you for uh, your remarks and for sharing part of your personal story. But my first question is, uh, is there anything in your view that needs improvement or modification or overall overhaul uh, broadly in the division, but specifically in regards to uh, Penn Police? What, what needs to get better, do you think? So uh, Chaz, we, we have never stopped improving uh, and looking for ways to improve the entire division of public safety. Penn Police uh, obviously are on the front lines day and night and have opportunities to, uh, for points of failure. So we are always looking at that. And so a good example of how we are able to constantly review uh, the landscape of policing with best practices uh, is through our accreditation process through CALEA, C-A-L-E-A. And uh, we have been accredited since 2001. And I have to say that because of that accreditation process, and, it, and we were up for reaccreditation every three years, uh, they just changed it now, next time will be four years. Uh, but we, we have improved our policies and procedures and we, had, we did best practices. I think beyond uh, the nuts and bolts, if you will, of policing with policies and procedures, which your commission has uh, free access to and uh, to review. I, I think um, I think these are emotionally difficult times. Uh, I recently met with every minority police officer on all three shifts, and I wanted to hear how life was for them. And I was reminded by several of them who none of my officers are shy and they're very forthcoming. And um, some of the black officers have had their own personal experiences, even in the midst of COVID. Wearing a mask is a difficult thing for uh, some folks, particularly black men. And so I feel that we need to do more support uh, mechanisms for our minority officers um, and, um, and also uh, just in general to make sure that the officers feel supported. Um, and I will be the first one to separate an officer who is not going to, uh, not, not going to follow our rules, regulations, state and federal law, because that person would be a handicap to the reputation of not only the Penn Police and the Division of Public Safety, but the University of Pennsylvania. So in short, I would say that I think it's more emotional of what, what can we do uh, to, and, and they've had a lot of training around that and as, as uh, Ben Wobb mentioned, uh, we have gotten specific training on mental health uh, response from uh, uh, CAPS and from him and uh, meetings with our supervisors. And so I, I would be very open, uh, especially in your world, Chaz, um, to, to find out how we can feed the souls of the police officers so they can in turn uh, be even more empathetic during this very difficult time in our society. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice President Rush, for your statement and for being willing to answer our questions. Uh, you stated in your original statement that you recognize and understand the hurt and anger surrounding the killing of George Floyd and the protests that uh, arose surrounding that. Uh, you probably know that some protesters, including organizations at Penn, like Police Free Penn, are calling for defunding the police or even uh, disbanding the police, including the University of Pennsylvania Police Department. And I wondered what you think about those calls, how you place them in your understanding of the protests against uh, the, the killing of George Floyd, which was, of course, protests against broader um, concerns about police conduct and the role of police in our society. And we could extend that to sure. that pen. So, but I just would like to hear your response to that. Right. I, I have to tell you, Dr. Roberts, uh, when I saw the video of that killing 
mm-hmm. of Mr. Floyd. It was a killing of Mr. Floyd. Mm-hmm. And it, it brought up two things. It brought up at first, and we all have talked about this in the news. We've talked about it internally here at, in Penn Police. Uh, that number one, there was, there was so, when I talk about failure points, mm-hmm. that was a case study. You had a gentleman, you had a, you had a person who was masquerading as a police officer uh, who basically murdered a man over an extended period of time in broad daylight being filmed. And number two, that his department had, in spite of 17 or 18 complaints against police that were substantiated, he continued to serve. And more importantly, that they put him in the position as a field training officer for those other three officers. And at least two of those officers who were on the sidelines uh, had like three days on the job. And they were not strong enough to persist in the bystander response that we teach here at Penn Police. And so that's number one. The the number one issue here is uh, the lack of um, discipline, training. Uh, I could go into a whole lot around police arbitration processes uh, that, that, you know, even when best practices are followed, people can try to get their job back and the whole issue of, you know, moving from one department to another. So they're, they're the real uh, meat and potatoes of a lot of problems around police departments. Uh, number two, I think, um, you know, this, they, they, we've, we've seen, unfortunately, other uh, police brutality cases that resulted in the murder of, of an innocent person across the country. The thing that made this so different, I think, is first off, it was one film and it was just the most brutal killing, regardless of who was kneeling on Mr. Floyd's neck. But also in a time of COVID, there was so much penned up frustration and people have more time to to really have their voice come out. So I think uh, this was um, this was a recipe for everybody needs to stop and we need to look at every police department across the country and we as police in in internally as a police uh law enforcement official for uh, for 44 years uh, i am i am absolutely devastated when i see police actions like that and i'm angry and it's time for all the police chiefs across the country to take on the hard issues around unionization and arbitration and ways in which things are discipline is is held up. So I, you know, I, I could go on for another hour on this issue because it's really personal to me, uh, and and it's it is really destructive to our society. If I could just follow up a bit, uh, I was also asking about the particular demands to defund. Yes. Or, and or disband the police. And right. there are calls for that directed specifically at the University of Pennsylvania Police by Police Free Penn, for example. Yes. So I wondered if you would respond to that yeah. as well. So I've been here now, this is my 27th year, and uh, the Public Safety Division, including the, the 121 members of the, of the Penn Police Department today, and that gro- has grown over the years. Um, and and uh, this, the University City, West Philadelphia, went through some very, very difficult crime challenges uh, during the, 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 well, in the 80s, but from my vantage point, uh, 96 through 99, and then again in 2006 and 2007, where more resources were given to uh, public safety's budget, uh, more officers were hired, more allied officers were placed on the streets, and um, better, better technology was put into our PENCOM Center. And all of this was in support of what the requests were coming from, from parents, from uh, current students, from graduate students, from uh, alums. Uh, and uh, we, were at a, we were at a cross point where people, you know, it's Maslow theory, if people don't feel safe, they're going to maybe not choose to come to Penn personally or to send their children. So all of that was done uh, from, a, from a crime prevention issue. But I have to say that that's way expanded. And just like hearing about the mental health uh, systems, um, I was part of both mental health task forces and the, um, the development, for example, of the helpline 
uh, was was done in the first um, mental health task force, and and it, it was decided that it would rest in public safety's communication center because we're 24/7. And as all of those systems evolved and working with CAPS uh, and now with uh, Dr. Dubay's uh, organization, uh, that has continued to develop because that issue became actually more important than crime because we, we were doing well with crime, but then we saw mental health really uh, ratcheting up and also alcohol uh, issues where students were, were getting themselves hurt. My, my long, uh, the long story here is that I don't believe by defunding Penn Police that this would be of any service to uh, the members of this community, both Penn community and University City and West Philadelphia community. We don't just patrol Penn, we go out to 43rd Street we can go further, but that's where we chose many years ago due to personnel, numbers, et cetera. But, but the point is, is that we do way more than what normal police departments do because we are part of an ecosystem that not only stays in public safety division, but we work with uh, student wellness. We work with the student intervention services out of DPUL. Uh, we work with the college house systems. We work with the cultural resource centers. And all of these people, they don't have to call, you know, 511 from their desk phone or 5733333. They pick up the phone and they talk to their liaison. Uh, could be a detective, could be a police supervisor. They call me. Um, so the, if we wanted to fund Penn Police, I think we just need to say, all right, well, what do they really do? Because it's like any, it's like any uh, organization. It, it doesn't stay static. And it grows and it, and it handles situations that are uh, the, the hot uh, situation, the hot problem. Um, so um, I'm, you know, I, I'm not saying that policing can't evolve into another pattern, another, maybe, maybe it's time. But the social service agency issues that all police departments, all police departments have to handle such as child abuse, working within the city. And when I was in Philadelphia police, I would see the most horrendous uh, elder abuse and child abuse. And at three in the morning, when I called DHS, Department of Human Services, they often couldn't come out. Fortunately, at Penn, we call our partners here, whether it's VPUL or, or CAPS or HUP Psychiatry, and we get help immediately. So we're fortunate, we're very fortunate, but again, Nothing that we do here at Penn is just about what Penn police do. It's the division and it's us as a community. So I'm willing to look at anything and I'm willing to see what, which way this could go, but we need to remember what, what, is, what is being served right now for not only Penn community, but the West Philly community and who will do that if it's not the Penn police or not PennCom or allied. Uh, VP, my question is related to that. Um, on the website, it describes UPPD as the largest private police department in the Commonwealth. Yes. It contains the second largest number of full-time sworn police officers amongst all private universities in the U.S. and the third largest number of sworn officers for all universities nationwide, public and private. Um, I, I think ultimately the question I want to ask is, could it be possible to reduce the size of UPPD, in your view, and still maintain a safe environment on and around Penn's campus. So Chaz, I will, I will take us back to, again, the, the 90, 98 era uh, when uh, Judy Roden was president, and then again in 2006 and seven with uh, doc, Dr. Amy Gutman as president. And the reason that the growth of the Penn police occurred, um, because when I first came here in uh, 1994, I was actually the director of victim support which uh, is Pat Brennan's uh, position now. And there were probably only about 78 sworn police officers. Um, but there were a lot of issues. There were a lot of crime. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of anytime there was an uptick in crime, you know, the, we, we had to set up hotlines for parents to call in and, and others. So the growth of the police department uh, happened in large part to the, the growth of Penn. Um, because when you look at what Penn was like in 94, and you look at what Penn is like today with the growth of, of uh, you know, beds, uh, dorm space, uh, third-party development, retail, restaurants, 
this is a whole different uh, environment than it was when there were 78 officers. So could we reduce, uh, I know there's, there's some folks who feel that uh, you don't need police, that uh, you can use allied security officers and they could go and, uh, and do all these things. Um, I, I don't agree with that. Uh, I think that we have put together a program that is a national model where you have police doing what police need to do and you have security having security uh, duties that took away a lot of the old duties that the security, the police used to do, like unlocking doors uh, and, and, and things like that. So now the, the other thing is people want to see uniforms on the street. And I know again, and I would love to learn more that, that uh, people of color may feel threatened by seeing uniforms on the street. We have to hear that voice, but the voices that have been very loud over the many, many years I've been here have been more. They want more, 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 more lighting, more police, more allied. And that's where we are today. So if we were to peel the onion, as, as we just talked about with Dr. Roberts, um, and changed what the Penn police do and change what their liaisons are going to be and not be, um, and have them be more of a model of what a municipal police department does. Because I'll tell you, if you call 911 and you have... Um, uh, you're, you're the dean of uh, one of our schools and you're getting threatening letters and things like that. You call 911 for that resource uh, and for, for help with that. Forget it. You're not going to get, no, they're not going to handle that. So Philadelphia police went from 8,000 to 6,600 over the last 40 years. And they're, they're, they've had a cut back on what services they give to the Philadelphia community. But I will tell you, they're not, Penn, the, the, the community of Penn has become accustomed to and loves the additional services, which I could put a, a, you know, a, a PowerPoint together and it would be about 20 pages long with all of the, what are, people would say, why are the police doing that? There's a lot of reasons. There was demand for it. So could we? Yeah, we could. But then we, again, just like all the other issues, we'd have to say, well, who, who handles this? Who handles that? Who's here at three in the morning? Are we going to have BPUL work around the clock? Are we going to have psychiatry work around the clock? They're the questions, and uh, probably above my pay grade to make that decision. Thanks. So let me ask you a question that's sort of related. It came up in your answer. So we've been talking about, and you've been expanding on the various functions that Penn police do uh, that are beyond what we think about. Tra perhaps traditional pol police officers doing. But I want to ask about what pol Penn police do that is part of what we think about traditional police officers doing, which is the power to arrest members of the public. And the surrounding neighborhood uh, around Penn is policed by at least five different police agencies. Um, and all have this power to arrest. Uh, Penn has sworn officers, right? Yes. So, uh, but on the other hand, unlike the Philadelphia Police Department, there isn't the same accountability that Penn police have to the people of the broader public who could be arrested by Penn police. And I wondered if you would speak to us about that broad power to arrest and whether that's necessary because you've talked about other kinds of services the police do, the Penn police do, that uh, we can think about, are they necessary? But what about this power to arrest and its implications for people who are not necessarily part of the Penn community or on campus? This is outside of campus even. So again, predominantly, we will uh, be from 30th to 43rd Street, up to Presbyterian mm -hmm. Hospital now with the Trauma Center, uh, so a little bit above market, and then to Baltimore Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, we do uh, arrest people who do not, are not part of the Penn community, but have committed a crime on Penn's campus. Mm -hmm. Luckily, um, well, just this week, we had to put out, in the last two weeks, two UPenn alerts. Uh, for uh, gunpoint robberies, um, 
unfortunately, uh, in both instances, the uh, suspects were not apprehended. But let's say they were. Um, we would follow the same systems that uh, Philadelphia police, the same uh, uh, preliminary arraignment system. Uh, we would have to have the district attorney's office uh, review and approve the charges. We don't decide who the tr what the charges are. Um, district attorney could say, I'm not charging at all. Um, the offender would then go into the same system if they were arrested by the Philadelphia police and all the due processes uh, starting with arraignment court all the way to the conclusion of a trial, we would participate as would any other police department in Philadelphia. Um, we are, you know, we are, our goal here <clears throat> is to have a safe community. Uh, luckily, uh, we're, we're, we're at the moment, we have not been challenged by uh, homicides, um, but I am concerned about the uptick in armed robbery, and I'm, up, I'm very concerned about uh, when I see what's going on in the city of Philadelphia with the number 35% increase in homicides and shootings. And we know that because we also cover uh, and have an officer assigned around the clock at Presbyterian Trauma Center. So we are, we are intimately aware of the violence that is going on around us. Um, the, our police department, is patrolling in a two and a half square two and a half square mile area, and we have probably more supervision on everything our police officers do, whether it's through our CCTV network, uh, where, where if they're making a car stop or a pedestrian stop or making an arrest, the camera if it's a camera in the area they're, they're on camera. They also wear body worn cameras, but more importantly, on any situation like I just described, if there had been an arrest. Uh, this past week when I sent the UPenn alert out, a supervisor would be on the scene and they would ensure that all of the processes were being, uh, uh, were, were uh, legal uh, and appropriate for the mission of our department. Okay, let, let me follow up on that because this obviously has a lot of implications for members of the West Philadelphia community who aren't uh, Penn students or faculty or staff who could be arrested, uh, stopped arrested by the Penn police. Because one possibility would be that because there's so many agencies already patrolling this area, there isn't a need for Penn police to do it as well. Um, and so, but Penn police are uh, as you described, able to stop, frisk, arrest uh, members of the West Philadelphia community, even if they're not on campus at the time. So I, let me ask together a couple questions about that. Um, one is, what do you think is the relationship between the West Philadelphia community and the Penn police. And for sake of time, I'll just uh, ask another question, which was an example of where there were protests by West Philadelphia community members about Penn police action in their neighborhood. And that was the incident at 52nd Street on May 31st, where Penn police were involved in mm -hmm. um, an incident where there was use of tear gas um, and members of the community um, have said that they felt they were uh, assaulted by police officers, which included the Penn police. So I'd, I'd like you to, um, I know this is a lot at <laughs> once, a lot to cover, but uh, many people are focusing on that incident yep. uh, as a reflection of the Penn police. So and its relationship to the West Philadelphia community. So can you just say a, a little bit, uh, you know, about the relationship with the community, but also focusing on the specific incident, mm -hmm. uh, when Penn police would come to the assistance of Philadelphia police officers or other uh, officers, um, is it in your discretion to decide whether to do it? 
Uh, and what do you think about the way in which the Philadelphia police reacted or acted? Um, I saw an image of a, it looked like a tank going down the street, dispersing tear gas randomly and, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, on the street, um, affecting people who lived in that neighborhood. So what, what, how do you, how did, what did you think about that? What do you think, and what does, does that tell us anything about the relationship between Penn Police and the broader West Philadelphia neighborhoods? So let me go from the macro to the micro. Okay. We have our powers of, of uh, police powers, if you will, are through the state of Pennsylvania. And mm -hmm. as such, we, you know, boundary wise, we, we, we go where we need to go when needed. How does that work? Well, we have a memorandum of understanding, an MOU with the Philadelphia police, the commissioner and I signed that. And it basically points out uh, the jurisdiction issues about our detectives versus their detectives handling investigations. And uh, we answer about 250 911 calls that are called in by anyone, uh, that, but in our patrol zone. And we answer about 250 a month it takes, takes that workload off of the 18th district, which is where we reside, and the 16th district where Presbyterian is located. Um, and so we don't answer that call, get to the scene and say, oh, it's an auto accident. Oh, you're not a Penn community member. We can't handle this. We handle it. Same thing if anyone's a victim of crime. And so the, the MOU lays all of that out. And in, in, in effect, it's a mutual aid uh, agreement as well with the understanding that if we were having an issue here on Penn's campus, as we had in the 90s, and we, we, could, we could ask for assistance. The, um, before the 52nd Street incident, we had something very similar, and you, you may recall after you, you hear me talk about this, but there was a, a, a man who tried to assassinate a, a black female sergeant, Philadelphia police sergeant, who was parked in a patrol car at 52nd and Sanson, right next to 52nd and Market. And uh, there was what was called an assist officer called. And there was a second assist officer and a third. And, and the reason there were so many assist officer calls is because they didn't have enough police personnel to handle the situation. And after he shot into the woman's patrol car 16 times, he proceeded to go east on Sanson, where he killed another innocent woman who was sitting in her car, getting dropped off from work, shot her boyfriend, uh, shot another person, and ultimately shot a Penn police officer who was one of my officers responding to the assist call. Uh, thankfully, uh, uh, our officer uh, was shot three times and thankfully uh, is, is here today and survived. That's an example uh, of how, and many in between, where we have gone out to assist uh, another jurisdiction. Same thing would happen for Drexel if they had a problem. The day of the 52nd and Market situation, there were multiple assist officer calls that were coming in. And then I was getting phone calls from high level police officials at the deputy uh, commissioner level who uh, were totally uh, overwhelmed uh, and were, uh, you know, were, were having police cars burned, were having officers hit in the head with bricks. Uh, there were explosions of propane tanks and, um, you know, it wasn't my first choice, really, to send my officers out to a scene that I knew people were going to get hurt. Um, and so we did a, a very strategic number of officers uh, under the command of my deputy chief uh, of emergency preparedness. And uh, these officers are, uh, are, are trained, uh, you know, at a higher level for response to emergencies and tactical issues. Um, they, they did proceed to go out. Um, and they started calling assist officer calls because it, 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 it continued to be very, very violent. Our officers, A, we don't have gas. We don't, we, we've never had gas. We don't have, we don't have uh, pepper balls. Uh, uh, we, we do have, uh, pep, you know, we do have regular um, uh, pepper spray. Uh, but at that, that, when they went out there, their job ended up being to stop more people from coming in and attacking the rear of the police officers that were kind of pushed into a, a situation where they, they, they were like against the wall. And this was pre uh, Philadelphia SWAT coming in with the pepper spray. What they were doing is they were also helping Philadelphia Fire Department 
were calling for assist officers too, because they were trying to put out fires uh, in various places uh, uh, in, in that area where, where the uh, rioting was occurring and police cars were being burnt, other, other things were being burnt. They were getting thrown, they were, they were having things thrown at them. So our officers specifically uh, shielded them so they could put out fires, assisted some of the store owners who needed to get out of their stores but were trapped, and a couple other elderly people who were trying to get to a safe place. Uh, they never used force, they didn't make any arrest, and that was their role. And that sort of was my agreement with the uh, deputy commissioner who called, and, and I said, they're gonna be together, they're gonna be under the command of my deputy chief, and we're gonna be auxiliary to help with these issues. And um, I have three police officers that are still injured from that incident on May 31st uh, with serious injuries. You're on mute, Dorothy. Thank you. The Penn police were not involved in the tank or whatever, I don't know how to describe it, going down the street with, it looked like tear gas or pepper spray or something coming out of it, uh, where there were no people who were doing anything violent on the sidewalks. It, it looked to me as if they were spraying residences um, without provocation at that point. Um, and so that was that was a Philadelphia Police Department. Right. Equipment. And there are there are three investigations ongoing from uh, various various parts of the city. So, the, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I wasn't there. But okay. um, I'm sure that will be one of the focal points of the investigation. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, VP, I, I just have one more question. Then Dr. Dubay and Dr. Colleen, thanks for your patience. Yeah. Um, Pivot to you in a sec. Um, my final question is around transparency. And um, I think a, a broader question around openness to transparency around uh, internal directives and a budget and different things like that. But specifically, one of the questions that came up in the Q&A was around transparency, around accountability of officers who make mistakes, officers who have, have credible accusations. How open are you and how open is DPS to greater transparency, one, around what happens when a cop does something bad? And so maybe you can even sort of flesh that out a little bit, like who investigates the officer? Um, what's that process look like? Is the rest of the university involved? Is the community that is policed involved? And, and, I, and I sort of qualify by saying, I know when officers are being interviewed, DPS is actually very open. And you all seem to invite different partners to be a part of the interview process and to sort of sign off on new officers coming. Um, and I think if, and to sort of try to add two questions here, when officers are interviewing, do we accept officers who've been terminated from other departments, who've been disciplined there? So I see you nodding your head no on that one. But could you say a little bit more about when officers get in trouble? Yeah. What's that look like? And is there room for greater transparency there? So I, I think you bring up a great, uh, a great point that I'd love to tell people about, and that is the hiring process for Penn Police. Uh, we created the uh, community hiring board uh, about 15 years ago. And uh, we put together uh, volunteers who are people, maybe uh, HR, affirmative action, resource center directors. Um, uh, Chaplain's office has, I don't know you, but Steve has sat on it. And the panels uh, that recruits, uh, first off, even before anyone would, would receive an interview in person, uh, their, their background uh, you know, their, their resume, do they have the qualifications, all of that is vetted. Uh, that's not at the point where you do the internal review because, you, because of HR issues, you have to have a signed uh, offer. But these people come in and they sit in front of our community members and, and Penn Police supervisors. And we, we have uh, one question in particular that is always asked and it's asked by the community member and it's around diversity. And we have had, uh, you know, the, the, I review then the interviews that are written and also talk to our 
colleagues across Penn who serve on the community board. And if they say this person probably doesn't have the ability to understand diversity in the way that Penn police need to, I'm done. I don't need to have any other part of the process. Secondly, the very end of the process, they call it the chief's board. It's me and generally one or two of my, my deputies. And I also ask, um, I ask a, a, a diversity question that's about what do you, you know, what do you do and how do you treat uh, a person who was stopped by you because there was a description of a robbery, the person looked like they fit that description, turns out that the person was not the individual. How do you respond to the pain and hurt of the individual you stopped? And if they go down the, the line of, well, I'm doing my job, I'm doing my job, I will stop them and I'll say, I got that, but this person was just walking around. How do you tend to their, their fear? That was a fearful thing. And it was also an embarrassing thing because people may have watched that stuff. People that get hired say, I will apologize for this bad experience and, and the, the, uh, the timeliness that it maybe had taken and ask them, A, can I drop you off somewhere? B, if you'd like to make a complaint against police, I will call my supervisor. They're the people to get hired, Chess. Uh, the other ones don't. But even to that point, they still go through a very rigid background check, not just calling the, if they were in another department, calling that department to check to see if they're invest they have any, uh, you know, uh, discipline uh, where they terminate it. Uh, and uh, also we do uh, interviews uh, in their neighborhood, their families, people in the neighborhood, and that has proven to be very useful. And there were times where I did not hire someone who um, looked terrific during the interview, but we found out he was a domestic violence perpetrator by his neighbors. So we go to great lengths to do that. And as I always say to the finalist, when before we hire them and then during their orientation where I meet with them and I look them in the eye and I say, if anything is going to happen that's going to affect me at three in the morning or at 9 a.m. when I get a phone call, it's going to be you doing something wrong on the street. And we are going to make sure that doesn't happen. And that's, that's the level of detail that we go into because really police departments, the first, the first part is the hiring. The second part is retention. I have fired numerous police officers for uh, either, you know, not, not, nothing criminal, but around criminal to people who are at the other end of this, where, you know, the, the way in which they uh, have complaints or they, the way they talk to someone or the way they were uh, just didn't fit our environment. And through progressive discipline, um, working with human resources, uh, they were terminated. So to your point about the transparency, we don't, we don't just do it in public safety. We work with labor relations, with uh, human resources and labor relations, with affirmative action. If it's a sexual harassment issue, or I, had a, I fired a, a, an officer a couple of years ago who thought he was, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, a catch, I guess, and, you know, started texting a, a person he had just helped, uh, and, and he was terminated. So, the transparency goes there, but more importantly, and, and as uh, Dennis Colhane, Dr. Colhane just talked about, at the advisory board in April, all of the issues of the complaints are put on the table. Uh, we ask, we, you, the board is allowed to ask questions uh, to get, uh, you know, was this, is this a person who's a frequent flyer? Um, and I will tell you, we don't have frequent flyers because if you're gonna be a frequent flyer, I am not gonna have you here because we see what happens. We saw what happened in Minneapolis with the frequent fire. Nobody wants that person in this department. Well, thank you, Vice President Rush, for your statement and for your answer to our questions. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. I'm uh, now gonna move on to our next uh, panelist, Dr. Dennis Colhane. Uh, thank you for your statement as well, and your willingness to uh, speak with us today. Uh, my first question to you is, what in your view would it mean for Penn 
to do the right thing in response to the ongoing and powerful movements in favor of serious change in our concept of public safety and policing? It's a good question. I'm not an expert in, uh, in the area of public safety and policing, um, but um, you know, observing a lot of what's been happening and, and reading about uh, various proposals, I think a lot of the uh, social service oriented activities that public safety has to get involved in, um, you know, could be handled. But, you know, I'm in a school with a, you know, MSW's Masters of Social Work program. Um, you know, people who are in a social work background are, I think, in some cases more equipped to deal with many of the issues that um, are put on police departments. Um, and I think that it is time to rethink um, whether we should have um, within, the, within public safety, people who are not police, but who are providing social work assistance um, and are available to do so um, in the same kind of emergency response situation. You know, the, the department has to deal, for example, with homelessness issues. Uh, obviously, we've heard about the student mental health issues. Um, mm -hmm. There are, you know, student to student kind of stalking situations. I mean, you can imagine the whole range of issues that, you know, would not necessarily, certainly would not call for an armed officer to have to intervene. So I think that um, this could be something that we could help model uh, that, you know, thinking about how to bring the social service emergency service capacity uh, in a way that right now just falls to the police by default. Um, so I think there's a number of things like that. Um, I would say I think the division of the department has actually modeled um, how to look at the bias-based profiling issue. Um, I think that we got, we had a most unfortunate incident that led to the ad hoc committee. Um, but as a result of that, it sort of fast forwarded us in terms of you know, making sure that the division had a much better, stronger statistical approach. So we have brought sort of the social science perspective and there are criminologists on the advisory board who help to interpret some of the data. You know, we have officer level and sector level review of stops and the, I believe, you know, uh, we were among the first to actually be recording um, the pedestrian stops. Uh, in terms of the race uh, of people on pedestrian stops, which of course is a big issue. That's one thing I've heard from people in the community is they don't like being stopped because they fit the description. And too often in, uh, in West Philadelphia, I mean, the description could describe almost anyone on the street practically. Um, so I think that, you know, we had put, we put some accountability around that. Well, we didn't. The <laughs> advisory board and the ad hoc committee recommended these things. Um, so, but I, I think we do have other social science pr perspectives that we could bring to this that could help refine um, ways things are done. And um, I think we could become a model and I think that would be great. Let's use this process that you're undertaking as a way to bring fresh eyes to this and imagine different forms that public safety could take. Um, and I think that would be a welcome conversation. It's very helpful, Dr. Colleen, thank you. Um, you've served at the helm of the advisory board for a number of years now. Do you think that the advisory board is sufficient oversight for the Division of Public Safety? It is not oversight. Um, so it, it definitely to be clear, it, it is not have an oversight function. It has just a, an advisory function and as I mentioned in the beginning of my remarks, we don't have a formal charter or charge. There is within University Council a safety and security committee that does have basically a more formal charter and charge um, that advises, you know, the University Council on various uh, public safety issues. So we don't have that. So I would say it would not be appropriate to look to the advisory board as oversight because we are not oversight. Um, in that same way. Could, could I ask a, just a quick follow-up question? Then? Do you think there needs to be um, non-DPS oversight over the division? 
Well, I, I presume that um, like every division within the university, they report. So I, you know, uh, public safety reports to the EVP's office and the EVP could have its own approach to oversight if it wants to go beyond what it has currently. I don't really know what that is. Um, they, I think what a lot of times when people talk about oversight, they're talking about complaints against police and they would like to have civilian uh, review of complaints against police. And I don't think that the um, leadership would necessarily disagree with that. We've not, I've not asked that question directly of Maureen or others, but um, it's the union contract that prohibits them from having civilian review. And around the country, we're hearing people call for changes in these union contracts. And um, so I think that that's another opportunity where next time that contract is renegotiated, if we want to have civilian review of complaints against police or some role in that process, um, I think that would also be welcome. Um, I think that as an advisory board, it, it, as part of this process is unfolded, Maureen mentioned that um, there are community meetings that are held the first Thursday uh, in West Philadelphia in collaboration with um, uh, intergovernmental relations. Uh, and uh, there's also the meetings with the local community associations. But, um, you know, th there are some people I know, I don't know them personally, but I know that there are a few people who've been really committed, dedicated, go to all of those things. They're, you know, f basically uh, untitled leaders in the community who are really engaged in these conversations and care a lot about uh, what's going on. And I, I think it would be an interesting idea of whether we could have some of those community reps attend these advisory meetings so that the community had a seat at the table. I think in the past, when we just, when we first were forming, um, the idea was to try to find among the faculty and staff people who lived in West Philadelphia. So that's, I know the reason that I was involved because I've been living in West Philadelphia for 30 years, had two sons who've been arrested by the DPS. Um, and, um, you know, so I have, you know, I think that that's a, uh, a, a an idea that could be welcome, um, that we could add some community membership to the table. And, and there, I know there are people who would be eager and willing to participate. Well, you just stole my next question out of my mouth because uh, as you were talking about uh, and uh, Vice President Rush talked about meetings in West Philadelphia um, and, uh, and as you were mentioning leaders there who uh, are very engaged, uh, uh, my question was, and it it's, was whether there were members of the West Philadelphia community, representative leaders like those on the advisory board. So I take it that there are not at this point. Maybe you could just share a little bit about the membership of the board. I mean, not every single person, but who makes up this board? And uh, I, 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 I take from what you just said that you would recommend that there be members of or representatives from the broader West Philly community uh, on the advisory board? Yes, I think that it was originally envisioned as a way to provide feedback to the vice president uh, of public safety, the perspectives from the different administrative units on campus mm -hmm. and some of the VPUL units on campus. Uh, which I sort of think of separately from the, what I quote unquote, administrative. Um, and then there has been faculty who've been invited because they have some expertise, specifically, for example, in domestic violence and in criminal justice. But I think there's it, probably at least 15 or 10, if, uh, 12 to 15 of the administrative units. So business services, facilities and real estate, transportation and parking, risk management, um, I don't know the whole list, but the, the, obviously general counsel's office. And then on the VPUL side, you have chaplain, you have housing, uh, international house, um, LGBTQ uh, center. Uh, and then there's student, grad student, undergraduate student reps. We've had at some point um, 
student who is asked to attend, uh, to either observe or to actually to come on a regular basis. We've had that in the past uh, and we've gladly accepted them. But it's been internal facing and because the purpose was really to try to make sure there was communication internally about what was going on, troubleshooting things, getting ahead of issues before they were there, you know, being able to talk to us about how we would feel. I mean, one of the big, big controversies we dealt with initially was around the, the closed circuit television cameras. Uh, and again, we became a national leader as a result of that. We put together, not, not public safety and not the advisory board, but a safety and security committee from university council with all these stakeholders, I put together this incredibly comprehensive policy about where cameras could be, where they couldn't be, uh, what they could be used for, what they could not be used for, um, and, you know, it was really, I think, a really well-informed document that has now been used by places all over the country. Um, so um, in, in that regard, I think that we've been, you know, able to innovate. Um, so I don't know, I got, hopefully I've answered your question. Thanks. Dennis, thank you so much. Anything else you'd like to add before we move to Dr. Dubé? No, I, I, I share, um, I think everyone in this uh, review committee and what Maureen said, I share the concerns um, that we have. I'm so glad actually that we're having these conversations about systemic racism as someone who works in social science research and has been studying aspects of systemic racism for years. It's just a welcome conversation. We need to have it. We have to have the hard conversations and we have to be willing to take on change where it's needed, where we can find better ideas. And we can't be afraid of those or defensive about it. Um, we have to be open to these conversations. And, and especially as a university, um, we should be modeling the best uh, and the best policy, the best behavior, the best connection to research and, and education. And, uh, and I also would just say, I've had several, I've known several of the uh, VP, um, uh, Vice Presidents for Public Safety. And I really say, you know, Maureen is an incredible manager. Um, I, it, just the way she provides leadership and oversight and works with her team, it's, it's, I, it's been something I've just admired over the years because um, it, just the passion and concern she brings, the ethics, you know, her deep concern for ethics, her always wanting to improve, being ahead of the curve in terms of adopting the best latest technologies for monitoring, for working against bias, et cetera. So I know that it's, it's a time for criticism and reflection and critique of what's happening with police departments, but I don't wanna get lost in that process. The fact that you know, we have been lucky to have the leadership, I think, of Maureen. I can't imagine, you know, um, I've seen other people. I worked for my whole career with public sector administrators and leaders, and she is among the best. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that as well. Thank you, Dennis, very helpful. Thanks. So uh, Dr. Dubé, thank you so much for joining us as well. Uh, this question about the role of the police in um, what might be considered non-traditional policing matters, especially the Penn police seem to be involved in lots of different things. Um, it was something raised in your statement because you mentioned that police officers provide assistance in dealing with students' crises. And uh, it now seems from our discussion that we should be questioning that. Uh, what, so I, I wanna ask you, do you think the police are the best people to provide this kind of assistance or might there be alternatives that Penn could examine, uh, Dr. Colhane just raised this as well, to assist students facing emotional or psychological distress that doesn't involve armed officers? Uh, I'll just leave it there. What's your, what, what are your thoughts about that? 
Um, I think I should clarify that while Penn police officers are involved in times of crisis, they're not always involved in times of crisis. They're not the go-to. We have multiple systems. Mm -hmm. So they're one of many available resources. And the, the purpose of my statement was to highlight how effective and surprisingly so um, Penn police officers have been. Because if we walk, to walk back the question a little bit, do I think that all police officers should be involved in crisis management in the context of a mental health uh, decompensation? The answer is no. Do I think that Penn police have the training and the skills to do so? Then the answer is yes, um, demonstrably so. So I'm, in my mind, I make a distinction right, between should police be involved in public, health, pu public mental health matters, uh, well, it depends on which police force uh, we're talking about. And, and as I've mentioned, I can attest to the effectiveness of our officers who really have received training that is tailored to our campus, our students specifically. But it's also important to remember that they operate as part of a system. Students have access to a clinician 24-7, um, and that was instituted two years ago by calling the same number they would call during regular business hours, whatever time of the day it is, and I would say wherever they are in the world, someone will answer the phone and they have access to crisis intervention by licensed clinician. Furthermore, when police officers are called because of uh, a tip they receive, or for whatever reason, if an armed officer appears in um, a student apartment, that officer will also call that number uh, to contribute to the intervention. So it's ne it never rests exclusively on the shoulders of the officers. The officers know that there is a clinician who's just a phone call away, and very often, if a higher level of care is needed, um, then the officers will transport the student to the nearest crisis response center where another uh, clinician can take over the evaluation. Thank you, Benoit. I, I just have one question. Um, one of the things that VP Rush said earlier was around the, over the years, the, the cry from students and parents around a desired increase in, in policing and presence. And, uh, and, and, and she inferred the psychological relief that an increased, you know, a strong, robust Penn Police has for, for some people. Could you speak to the inverse of that though? Uh, because I think there's been a lot said and written about the um, sort of challenging psychological effect that the presence, particularly of clothed police officers, clothed armed police officers can have, uh, especially on people of color, but really anybody um, could you speak a little bit about that on our campus or in general, and what do you think could or should be done about that? Um, so this, the need to address the triggering effect, if you will, or the re-traumatizing effect of armed police officers or of our, on our campus um, uh, rose to the surface uh, for because of recent events and was addressed and tackled by our counseling center staff who had uh, focus groups to find solutions and antidotes or uh, support mechanisms for students who are impacted in that way. Um, we have a student advisory board at our counseling center that helps us guide our programming and identify unmet needs and um, shows us the way as we try to craft and develop new programs or group uh, treatments. And that is one of the topics that has come up over the past few months because of all of this social unrest and this reaction and this awakening to issues of systemic uh, racism. Um, I, I hope I'm addressing the question that uh, you're putting forth, but that's, that's where my mind went uh, when I heard your, your question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I think, um, John, we're going to move on to the next set of panelists. Thank you so much, all three of you who spoke with us. We really appreciate your input and your time and your work.
Yes, all of the above. Um, thanks uh, so much to VP Rush and Dr. Dubay and Dr. Colhane for your experience, your wisdom, and your perspectives, and most of all, your time and participation in this process. Um, we are going to move to the second half of the, uh, of the panelists. Uh, so I also want to thank our audience who have asked uh, many great questions, uh, some of which we've answered and as suspected, some of which we weren't able to get to at this moment. Um, but I wanted to say again, for those of you whose questions we did not answer, please know that we have saved the questions. We're going to continue to take them into consideration as our review continues. Uh, and again, if there are other thoughts or information you want to provide, uh, the um, the information tab on Penn uh, Public Safety Reviews.org is available. Uh, the second half of the panel will include uh, Professor Regina Austin, uh, Haley Pilgrim, and Caitlin Best. We'll turn first to Professor Austin, the William A. Schneider Professor of Law at the University of Pennsylvania Carey Law School. Regina, you're on mute. Thanks. Um, I want to thank Professor Roberts and Reverend Howard for inviting me to speak. Um, I have submitted a written statement, which is supposed to be posted. Um, and I want to devote my time to just giving you a summary of uh, what I uh, what my thoughts were with regard to uh, this initiative. Um, I thought that I would analyze an account of a student campus police officer encounter that occurred not at Penn, but at Yale. Um, I'm a law professor. We talk about hypotheticals. And it's sometimes easier to talk about something that happened someplace else. Um, this encounter was extensively covered in the New York Times. The events speak to the universal predicament of maintaining public safety at a predominantly white elite urban university surrounded by minority communities undergoing substantial stress. And we know what the stressors are, gentrification, environmental injustice, poor schools, healthcare inequities, et cetera. Charles Blow is a Black New York Times op-ed columnist and the father of three kids. In an article entitled Library Visit, then held at gunpoint, Published in January of 2015, Blow describes how his son, a 21-year-old junior at Yale, was stopped by a campus police officer, gun drawn, and forced to lie on the ground. The officer had concluded that the child matched the description of a burglary suspect. Tall black male wearing a black coat, a red and white hat, and shoes with orange detailing. The child, and, and he was someone's precious child, uh, was uh, six foot one and was wearing a burgundy gray and red hat and a navy blue pea coat. Uh, his shoes were not described, but the description, I guess, was thought to be close enough. The student and the officer disagreed about whether the gun was pointed at the student or the ground. Uh, ultimately, the officers got around to asking the young man for his ID and they explained why they had uh, uh, forced him uh, to the ground. Um, the dad got apologies from the dean and the chief of police. An internal police investigation eventually cleared the officer. Right? I don't want to criticize what Blow had to say in the articles uh, that uh, I uh, want to discuss. Um, but I do want to push a bit and test the limits of his position in light of calls across campuses for defunding the police. Right? I'm doing what law professors do. Um, first, apart from the use of the gun, Blow found no problem with the stop itself. The school, Yale, uh, was his son's community, his home away from home, and he would, he, the son, would have appreciated reasonable efforts to keep it safe. Perhaps there's something amiss here. Black and brown students on white campuses like Yale's or Penn's pay a higher physical and emotional price for public safety than white students do um, by black students being subject to reasonable stops. The black and brown students 
And any black or brown person who happens to be on campus lawfully and innocently um, bear a larger share of the costs associated with securing such universities as relatively safe oases amid minority inequality, if not deprivation. Therefore, shouldn't the question be, what can we do to stop the stops? or to deal with the spillover effects of inequality and deprivation that we cannot keep at bay with police officers. Second point, Blow was happy that he had had the talk with his son. Um, for those of you who don't know what the talk is, um, it is about surviving encounters with armed police officers or police officers without arms. Um, the talk is one which minority parents see as a way to protect their children from disaster. Unfortunately, it is viewed as a way to protect the police. Um, the talk is treated as an admission that the onus is on the minority young person to control her or his emotions and to refrain from asserting his or her rights. Do white people have the talk with their children? Probably not. So here again is another cost borne by minority young people and their parents that are not shared by whites. And finally, Blow concludes that there is no way for young black people to earn their way out of such situations. There is no amount of respectability that can bend a gun's barrel. All of our bo boys are bound together. It may be that the institution and its officers are trying to get young black people um, to demonstrate their respectability um, so as to set themselves apart from the black criminal element. Doing so would make the officer's job of policing easier but it would impose a cultural and economic and political burden on the young black people, or the young brown people that whites do not bear. And that's not all. The burden falls on females as well as males. Blow underestimates the threat to black girl children and brown girl children whose sassy ways some would say nasty ways, can land them in trouble with the police. So what am I concerned with? That black kids and white kids are not being treated the same and that the black kids and the brown kids are bearing a burden that comes from the effort to turn the university into not only an oasis, but also a fort that gets built on the, on the backs of young minority people, both those who are part of the Penn community and those who live adjacent there too. The idea of the university being a benign oasis has to be questioned and deconstructed. And that is what the notion of defunding campus police is about. A university ought to have more ambitious ethical goals for its policing than a local government entity. The university police ought to be held to a higher standard when it comes to diversity and pluralism. And that's why I admire our advisors for articulating a goal for the university um, that takes seriously um, the issues of, and I'll, I'll quote them, or that prioritizes and promotes anti-racism, racial equality, and justice. Still, past studies and assessments of campus security measures suggest that those values are likely to remain more aspirational than operational 
when this iteration of review is done. A cynic would say that if the children of the university's wealthiest donors were treated the way Blow's child was, the university would find a way to eliminate the burdens I have described because of erroneous stops, and it would do so fast. It would be worth its while. So therefore the task for this review would be, in this cynic's view, can you conceive of any scenario in which every guilty unproven, un, in which every guilty until proven innocent black or brown child, student or non-student alike, who comes into contact with campus police were treated like the kids of the wealthiest donors. I want to hear the reference. Thank you. Professor Austin, thank you so much. Um, we would turn now to uh, Haley Pilgrim, a PhD student in sociology and a past president of the Graduate and Professional Student Assembly. Ms. Pilgrim. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I want to echo Regina in thanking Dorothy and Chaz for hosting this and their insightful questions so far. My name is Haley Pilgrim, and I sat on the CCTV monitor monitoring committee as GAPSA president in 2018 and met with Penn Police as BGAPSA president in 2017. But the hat I'm wearing for you today is as a GA, where I've worked for 10 police going on six years. I'm reading for you a statement written by a group of RAs and GAs. As former and current resident advisors spanning across all of Penn schools, including undergraduate and graduate programs, we are writing to support students, alumni, and organizers who are advocating for the funding of public education and the divestment of funding from the Philadelphia Police Department. We support Police Free Penn and Drexville Community for Justice in their calls to redirect funding away from policing and toward education and social services. As resident advisors, we received monthly briefings from a representative of the PPD that were racialized and biased against people of color living in the community outside Penn's campus. These tended to assume a fear-based narrative, providing basic superficial data about the number of petty crimes, assurances that the police were on it, and frequently anecdotes about Penn Police impressive shows of prowess in responding to petty crimes through surveillance, particularly black youth, in what might arguably be seen as setting people up to get caught. One GA reports that a detective said that he could tell who was a criminal as opposed to a student, and when asked how he could tell, started describing young black culture, for instance, baggy pants. As students and student leaders tasked with creating a safe and inclusive environment for young scholars and working together to provide programming and other means of community and individual mental health, we constantly receive text message alerts warning us about the climate of criminality surrounding and permeating Penn due to outsider activity. Police briefers did not respond to our continual request for information about the dangers of sexual violence, racism, and hazing in largely white fraternities on campus. When out-of-state white supremacists targeted Black first-year UPenn students in 2016 with racist messages and threats of violence, students and resident advisors protested. We marched with signs and megaphones to the football field where hundreds of Penn supporters were gathered to watch a game. The intent was to make a showing of support for Black students across the university and to inform Penn fans and alums about threats to the community. As students approached Penn police, and stadium security forcibly locked the entry gates to the stadium with an officer grabbing a student to prevent her from entering the gates as they were being closed. The police repeatedly blocked black students entry into the game even after we were told that we could enter with tickets, uh, which is usually not required Penn students can enter with an ID, but in the moment it was an effort to defuse the protest. Um, refusing to give information to protesters, but informing other students who didn't look like they were protesters. In an effort of social control, Penn Police then instructed all Black students and allies to line up in silence to prepare to have their bags checked in order to gain entry. Uh, even though all the students complied, they were still blocked from entering the stadium while 
entry was permitted for non-protesting, primarily white and Asian students. Police broke up the mass of student protesters, claiming that they could enter on different sides of the stadium, but when they got to each stadium door, the doors were locked. These students were just traumatized, um, trigger warning, with calls for their lynching. And so they were looking to have their voice and they were silenced by police and not treated with dignity and respect just hours later. We as RAs have long supported and requested funding and programming in mental health services. We encourage the uni university to redirect funding to recruiting, hiring, and retaining a diverse staff of counselors and mental health professionals. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pilgrim, we appreciate it. Um, next is Dr. Caitlin Best, a postdoctoral fellow at the Perelman School of Medicine. Good afternoon. I'd like to frame my remarks today by stating that I'm speaking both for myself as a postdoctoral fellow with 10 years of history at Penn and on behalf of Penn Community for Justice, a platform for any Penn adjacent person to organize for economic and racial justice through collective action centered on an equitable vision of Penn's relationship with Philadelphia. The stated purpose of this initiative is to evaluate Penn's public safety system. To be clear, it's private police force in light of the university's commitment to ensuring that every community member, quote, is treated with dignity and respect in ways that prioritize and promote racial equity, equality, and justice. If we are interpreting community to mean not just members of the university, but also the broader sociocultural context of the city whose land Penn occupies, then Penn has already failed in this commitment. Like other university police forces, Penn's private police department was developed to protect university property and wealth, not people. There's certainly plenty to protect. According to university archives, since moving to the West Philadelphia campus in 1872, Penn has expanded a hundredfold. The history of those property acquisitions is tarnished by systematic disenfranchisement from profit, profiting off of redlining practices that discriminated against growing black communities to urban renewal necessitated in part by neglect of properties the university already owned. Public policy initiatives were corrupted by conflicts of interest since they were conveniently headed by Penn trustees, presidents, and alumni. Penn consolidated its local power so effectively that when the Penn-led West Philadelphia Corporation destroyed the Black Bottom neighborhood, no one except community residents lifted a finger to stop them. These acts of violence against West Philadelphia communities, alongside decades of public disinvestment, set the stage for the crime and violence that took place along campus borders in the 1970s through 90s, to which Superintendent Rush has referred so frequently today. Rather than using its power and influence to affect positive change, Penn invested in an increasingly militarized private police force and blue light telephones to visually denote our territory. It is not a coincidence that today Penn holds $3.2 billion in tax-exempt property, has a $14.7 billion endowment, and has the second largest university police force in the country while also residing in the poorest major city in the country. I offer this history as an essential context for the remainder of my rem remarks because the Penn police cannot be viewed in isolation from this ongoing invisible violence. I am a cisgender white woman, so thankfully I've had few interactions with the Penn police department. Even so, I have found their commitment to public safety to be severely lacking. Like many other students, my first experience of Penn Police was at New Student Orientation, when the Department of Public Safety scared the living daylights out of students and their parents with vivid descriptions of the terrors of the urban environment. Then there was the video testimonial of a student who had been shot near campus, followed by admonishments not to go further west than 42nd Street. It is not that new students shouldn't be counseled to exercise caution in an unfamiliar city, but these sessions are undeniably psychological manipulation designed to foster a sense of dependence on campus police. In fact, my experience of living all over this city over the past 10 years has been one of comfort, and I've had the privilege of very rarely feeling threatened. I have felt unsafe on campus when I was hit, was almost hit by a car on my bike, while a Penn police officer sat on his phone in a patrol car at the corner. This has happened on multiple occasions, and because the color of my skin enables me to challenge the police without fearing for my life, I've sometimes asked the officers whether they were going to do something. Their response, not my job. My question to this panel, what is their job then? 
It's certainly not enforcing traffic safety because I've witnessed other cyclists hit by Penn Medicine's valet drivers, and my partner has been verbally threatened by one driving recklessly through the parking deck. Not crime prevention, because research shows that community investment reduces crime, not policing. Not supporting people in mental health crises, because that's what CAPS is supposed to do. I would like to conclude by lifting up the voices of those who have had the courage to share their experiences of racial discrimination by Penn Police through social media and published accounts. In one instance, the minority individual described being called a stupid effing drunk by a Penn police officer, while also being detained and having their belongings searched, probably illegally, as white students walked by, obviously inebriated but unhindered. Other students have shared similar experiences of racial profiling while studying late in the library, or most poignantly to me as a nursing alumna in Fagan Hall. The black students in that particular incident noted that Maureen Rush defended the officers in question rather than their rights as students to be in a campus building, thereby delegitimizing the students' trauma. Philadelphia residents have filed excessive force complaints against Penn Police, and let's not forget the events that have already been discussed that happened on May 31st at 52nd Street, when Penn Police were several blocks outside of their patrol zone, participating in attacks on protesters that triggered an NAACP lawsuit. The problem is best summed up by this final vignette. A Penn police officer told a student working on a class project that before every shift, their supervisor would say, it's a war out there, protect yourselves. Do we want armed police, campus police, who operate with a military mindset, few mechanisms for accountability, and view the community as the enemy? This is a sociocultural problem that goes beyond empty platitudes and toothless solutions. Penn has had several public safety review committees and panels like this one, all of which have re recommended additional training and reforms which have changed nothing. This time must be different. We should not be afraid of changing the status quo simply because it is difficult, especially when there is already research and alternative models to guide us. Policing in the United States is an institution created for the purposes of racial and class control. Even on college campuses and organizations built from that history cannot be reformed. We demand that the university pay pilot contributions into an education equity fund as actual publicly controlled community investment, permanently divest from the prison industrial complex and organizations supporting militarized policing, provide transparent publication of financial records for Penn Police and their relationships with the Philadelphia Police Department and commit to police free strategies for campus safety. Then and only then will we start to believe in Penn's commitment to racial justice. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you all three of you for very, very strong uh, testimonies. It, it means a lot that you took of your time uh, and that you shared of your, of your, uh, your experience and wisdom. Uh, Professor Austin, you, if I may, if we may question you first, um, you have a long, wonderful history here at the university. And I think there are a few people who understand Penn better than you. A big question here, if you became, if you were the president of, of Penn, if you were the head of our board of trustees, uh, what, what is the right thing to do right now in regards to policing? You, you're, you're muted, Chris. Sorry. Um, have I done it right? Okay. Um, I think that the police force um, at, at this point um, needs to be honest about uh, why it exists and um, undertake to uh, provide a mission statement that incorporates um, many of the values that you articulated in uh, your goals uh, for this review, but also to come clean about the way in which the police have uh, contributed to the aggrandizement of the wealth and power of the university. Um, and that it is part of an effort um, by the entire university 
uh, to begin to reallocate those resources um, back to the persons from whom um, they were in part stolen uh, and in part gained through what we consider to be the market. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your statement, which was very powerful. Uh, you expressed some cynicism about the uh, potential for meaningful change. Uh, you gave us a uh, one kind of standard we could apply. What would happen if a wealthy white donor's child were treated the way some uh, students of color and community members have been treated? Uh, and you've had experience with this before, and I wonder if you could share some of your insights from your leading the 2000 to 2001 Council Committee on Safety and Security with us. Uh, we noted that that committee report indicated that the effort wasn't successful, was not successful. So could you share with us why it wasn't successful and if there are any lessons learned that we might take up to be more successful? Um, because of the, the, the stay at home order, I have not been able to get into my office to find my files from that, from that period. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I would say that one of the problems was that we were not able to acquire um, qualitative data with regard to uh, diversity and the uh, uh, public safety division. And what you are doing now uh, with these hearings is an effort to begin to collect the qualitative data. Mm -hmm. um, we live in a, an environment as a, uh, a university where quantitative data is um, prized over qualitative data, um, where statements such as we have made um, are likely to be dismissed as uh, less than qualitative data as being political. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that um, our, our effort to collect qualitative data um, was a, a, an important one. Um, I, I do not believe that uh, the mechanisms for reporting uh, complaints uh, is uh, effective um, in part because you make the complaint to the very entity that is the employer of the person and the person um, very likely was following a protocol and so you get to the heart of the matter and nobody wants to go there. Um, I also believe that quantitative data is impacted by the uh, qualitative uh, context and that uh, you need to uh, understand the quantitative data uh, and you can't really understand the quantitative data without understanding of the qualitative context. I mean, if you take into account the talk, um, if an interaction goes well, um, the credit is given to the police officer, but it could very well be the product of the talk um, because you have put the onus on the, the suspect uh, to behave in a way that does not trigger a bad reaction on the part of the police officer. So you can tell me all about um, the, the, the stops and how well they went and how they were based on some notion of reasonable suspicion, and you would still have a racist society underneath all of that. So um, uh, we tried. Uh, we were much more successful in our effort to identify areas where uh, women were vulnerable, um, particularly with uh, regard to uh, uh, students who were involved in STEM activities, labs, going to labs at night and, and, and such. Um, but I suspect that there are probably also issues there 
um, that await um, a, an assault on campus, God forbid, um, before they will be investigated. Um, periodically, um, and Professor Calhoun, Calhoun can explain um, how the, the cyclical something happens. Um, someone gets assaulted, uh, something happens and uh, someone gets stopped and something happens, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, here it's George Floyd and um, the fallout from that. And one, one would hope that we would get closer to, to the root of the problem. Um, but it has to be done not only uh, with uh, quantitative data, it has to do also with collecting the stories and responding to people's um, hurt and also um, people's efforts to um, politically uh, mobilize to bring about a change in a powerful institution um, that is uh, capable of uh, destroying their ability to lead a good life. Thank you, thank you for that. I, I feel with uh, this second set of uh, speakers, we've heard some of the aspects of public safety that you just mentioned, Professor Austin. So thank you, thank you for highlighting that. So I'm gonna move now to uh, Haley Pilgrim. Uh, thank you, Haley, for uh, the powerful statement that you read. I am continually amazed at all the roles you play at Penn. Uh, we were thinking of your uh, past presidency of the Graduate and Professional Student Assembly, GAPSA, uh, and your uh, being a, a committee person for Ward 27, and you came in with yet another role <laughs> with the RA. So I'm sure there are many others as well. Uh, but let me uh, ask you something from your perspective as the former president of GAPSA. And uh, you already began that, but I wondered if you would share what you've learned in that capacity about students' experiences with Penn Public Safety in general and the police in particular. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I would say with the police in general and Penn Public Safety, our constituents that are from underrepresented groups, our black and brown people feel the same way they do with police in the outside world, which is in not safe. They feel like they have to wear pen gear as armor from racist incidents to feel safe on their own campus like they belong here. Whether that's uh, one student last year was entering into the political science building and the allied guard was asking for his ID, but not the white person walking in past him. And so there's this continual idea that's like not their campus. Uh, and um, I think a lot of times people may meet with the police and echoing what Re Regina said, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of meaningful changes forward. Even the CCTV monitoring committee I sat on, uh, we were kind of just rubber stamping where people, where we were already going to put up surveillance measures uh, with um, one of the other I, panelists had said like it, their advisory role. It's not, there's really no room to counteract and say, no, we shouldn't be increasing surveillance on campus. Um, the entire, uh, my question was in that committee, is the goal to ultimately have all the pens surveilled? And that's the goal. And so just every time the committee meets, we just rubber stamp more surveillance. Um, and so I think in that way, it feels like there's already that plan to move forward. And there's not a lot as a GAPSA president or something I could do. Thank you. Thank you, Haley, for uh, using your I'd like to follow up on the uh, surveillance question. Uh, it, it, not a lot of us have been on that sort of surveillance committee. Your thoughts on it broadly, on the kind of uh, the CCTV stuff and uh, how is, are we too surveilled? Not enough, your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I'll just say surveillance is a racist, me it's an anti-black measure. There's no way to have surveillance and it doesn't end up being anti-black um, is my personal belief. 
I have one time wanted uh, out like a person to walk with me somewhere for like safety and they were able to send the person right to me because they could see where I was in the shirt I was wearing like have I benefited as a light-skinned woman on campus from them being able to easily pinpoint me and send me someone yes is that worth an increase in surveillance no I think to have an institution that is safe for black and brown people is a not surveilled institution Thank, thank you for that. Um, I, I'm, uh, I'm going to ask you this question because uh, you are a committee person from Ward 27. Uh, and so I feel as if you are a representative of part of the West Philly community and we really haven't, we haven't had, I shouldn't say really haven't, we haven't had that input today. We will in future hearings. But could you say a bit, I know you could go on for a long time on this, but um, could you say something about what you've learned as a committee person uh, for Ward 27 about the Penn Police uh, interaction with your community? Totally. And I will say that my district is primarily Penn's campus. However, I do talk to a lot of other uh, committee members mm -hmm. and the committee or uh, the West Philly community doesn't even feel like they can go on Penn's campus, which is technically available for them to is technically public, but they don't feel safe to walk on or even be present on the campus. Uh, and so that we don't have a good relationship with our community. And I think we can make these strides forward by going to committee meetings but ultimately that doesn't change the fact of a lot about what caitlin said just the history of us uh destroying black lives in west philly um so yeah i think it is an intimidation for our west philly community thank you uh so you mentioned caitlin uh and her very relevant uh, statement about this question. So let me move to you, uh, Dr. Best. Uh, what you, you gave uh, a, a really, again, strong and powerful statement about the broader issues that may to many people not seem connected to Penn's public safety policies, but uh, you began to show how they absolutely are and I wondered if you could expand on what that would mean then for uh, what our committee should be looking at, uh, your suggestions for our recommendations. Uh, you did give, you were pretty concrete, but um, I just wanna give you an opportunity uh, because you added that perspective um, to elaborate some more about that. Sure, um, I'd be happy to. So, um, yeah, as you mentioned, I, I listed the demands that are being uh, um, put forward by Penn Community for Justice, as well as a lot of other organizations. And these aren't new demands. They're things that have been put forward by a lot of community organizations for a long time. Um, but fundamentally, I think the, the question of policing, whether it's on a college campus or in the city more broadly, um, really can't be extricated from issues of racial and economic justice. Uh, there's just too much literature out there to show um, that violence doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens as a result of, um, of disenfranchisement, of a loss of hope, um, of desperation and, and lack of resources. And, um, you know, not to, to paint uh, the West Philadelphia community into, you know, a, des a box of desperation, but um, just to say that when it's so clear that we as an institution are at least partially responsible for that, um, then I think it really does come down to, um, I mean, I personally believe that reparations are a conversation that we need to be having nationally, but um, in terms of what Penn can do specifically around policing and, and our campus is I think um, something that Haley touched on, like 
our campus was built with federal and state dollars. And as a nonprofit institution, we're supposed to be serving a public good. Um, so I think really reframing the language around our campus to be about it being an open campus and one that we do invite the community into to benefit from our learning so that it's not a one-sided, you know, our people go out and study West Philadelphians and, you know, bring in research dollars from that, um, but that, that we're actually giving something back to the community and not making them feel uh, oppressed, mm -hmm. frankly, by our police forces. Um, so I think that's a piece of it. I also um, find it really problematic. I mean, there's not a lot of clarity around um, how much money is spent on Penn Police, which is one reason why we're asking for transparency about financial records. Um, but I, you know, if it's anything like the city itself and, and many cities around the country, a huge portion of the operating budget is being put into policing um, our campus. And so what money could that or how could that money work differently in the community? And I'm not talking about, you know, the, the tokenization of the Netter Center partnership. I'm talking about real contributions that, um, that enable, you know, the Philly School District to take asbestos out of schools and um, to, to do a lot of things. And, and I think the final point I would make is that, you know, this is not about Penn deciding what the community needs. It's about the community saying, this is what we need, and then Penn footing the bill, honestly. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful way to put it, thanks. I appreciate the way that you presented the interconnectedness of various systems and, uh, and how it's all connected, how it's all related. Thank you for that. I, one of the questions I, I had for you was sort of asking for some advice uh, there, there have been voices that have called this whole process of this internal review um, kind of vulnerable to bias, understandably. And, uh, I, and I think that this is one of the things we talk about. It's the complexity of institutions investigating themselves. Is there anything that this initiative could do, in your opinion, to assure uh, Penn, broader Penn and West Philadelphia communities uh, of its institutional independence and its good faith and open-minded review? Um, what type of review do you think is necessary and, uh, you know, what, what can we do to uh, address our own public safety system without itself conducting, without public safety itself conducting some type of review? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And, and I will say, uh, you know, within our organizing groups, there, there have been a lot of conversations around uh, whether this is a true and genuine good faith process. Um, and, you know, we made the decision to be here today because we felt like it was important to at least take a seat at the table and, and hear what was being said um, and evaluate for ourselves. Um, so I think to address those concerns, um, you know, one avenue might be uh, if the university is unwilling to engage in a true external review, um, that there could be partnerships with organizations within Philadelphia that, that um, are, are committed to, you know, genu genuine work in this space. Um, to mind, um, and I'm, I'm sure there are a number of other organizations um, that, that would similarly be very happy to provide feedback to Penn um, about, about things that have gone on over the years. Um, I also think that transparency is, is really, really essential. Um, so I, I think people are waiting to see this first round of hearings, you know, it, is the recording going to be posted unedited or, you know, what's the, what's the outcome of, of these things going to be? And so um, I think it is really important to, to ensure that people see there's not, um, there's not behind the scenes machinations that end up coming out later. Um, I personally, actually not just personally, I think the group would agree with this as well. Um, I, I think it's problematic that while the uh, initial, I'm sorry, I don't really know the right term, but like the, the initiative members, um, 
are, are getting sort of this documentation from Penn Police about things like funding and mutual aid agreements with Philadelphia Police Department and stuff like that. Um, I think there are grounds to say that those are things that should be released to the public in some form. Um, and so, yeah, I think that would be my sort of off the cuff two cents. Very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think we can uh, wrap up the, if that's okay with you, Reverend Howard. Uh, I feel like we've had uh, such a full session today. I'm really grateful to everybody who spoke and shared so much information with us. And uh, thanks also to those who participated uh, behind the scenes in listening to the hearings and sending questions. We're recording this so it'll be available to everybody and we will have uh, your questions that we can uh, figure out how we'll uh, answer them and, uh, and address all the information that you've given us either uh, in the hearing today or in the questions and answers and comments that you sent. So thank, thanks to everybody for your participation. Uh, yeah, thank you all. Uh, I, on behalf of everybody, I want to, uh, again, sort of echo our appreciation and our gratitude uh, for your thoughts um, and your insights. Um, several of the questions that were asked pertained, pertained to how we intend to proceed from here. Um, this was the first of what we anticipate will be a, a, an as yet undetermined number, but perhaps as many as even eight to 10 additional uh, hearings. And I think that is necessitated by the broad diversity of views in our community. And by that, I mean the larger Penn and West Philadelphia community on these issues and the desire to have all of those views heard, recognized, and acknowledged. Um, uh, and we also hope, honestly, that by providing the PennPublicSafetyReview.org website, we will achieve what Professor Austin described as gathering the qualitative data um, to, to go along with the quantitative data. Um, part of the way the Quattron Center is structured is uh, we have a, a, an interdisciplinary blend of, of law professionals and social scientists, economists, statisticians, criminologists, sociologists. And so we hope we're particularly well positioned to gather and use that data uh, in thoughtful ways. And that's been a very intentional part of, uh, of the process. So um, this is uh, a first step of many in this process, but I think it's been an extraordinarily thought provoking uh, and useful one. And so I wanna thank everybody for that. Uh, and we look forward to continuing this process next Tuesday at two o'clock Eastern time. Um, and we will, uh, post the recording and a transcript as soon as possible at penpublicsafetyreview.org and it will not be edited for content.